Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for that very kind uh, introduction. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be in a seminar and in a discussion uh, with a room that contains uh, real people. And it's a special privilege, uh, exciting. We uh, have to recognize what we were missing. But of course, those of you who are uh, watching virtually are just as, as welcome. Um, what I've tried to do is to produce a set of slides which are more or less comprehensible if they're read without me. Um, so that uh, it's in lieu of a paper, if you like, and uh, there are references at the back. And for those of you who may be joining the seminar tomorrow afternoon, there'll be even more references at the back of that one. And I hope anybody who wants the slides, either for this seminar or, or this uh, meeting or for the seminar tomorrow, uh, if they can just ask. And I'm sure that uh, Robert's office will uh, be very happy to, to make them available. Um, I uh, was given the title, uh, or suggested the title, um, uh, from Robert's side. And actually, I think it's a very good title, so I, I didn't negotiate, I stayed uh, with it. So it's asking the question, um, where are we now, including the why should we be doing this? Um, who does what? That's the division of labor including central banks, but of course, the players are so much uh, beyond that. And uh, what should we do next? What are the priorities? So I thought that was a very good way of, um, of structuring the story. And that's what I'll try to, uh, what I'll try to do um, in, what, in what follows here. Um, let's remember what we have to do to keep two degrees or 1.5 degrees within reach. Some of these slides I'm going to go through very fast because they're for the record and I hope they're reminders so that I can spend a little more time at the end on the uh, discussion. But this shows that essentially we have to move down now and move down strongly um, in order to give ourselves a chance of uh, 1.5 degrees and uh, well below 2 degrees. These are increases in global surface temperature relative to the second half of the 19th century. It should be clear from the basic physics, which I'm sure you know, which is that it's the concentrations of greenhouse gases which trap the heat because the molecules oscillate at a frequency which interferes with the infrared as it bounces back off the Earth. That frequency of oscillation defines what is a greenhouse gas, and so the concentrations go up, more heat uh, is uh, trapped, and the higher the temperature. So if you want to stabilize temperatures, stabilize concentrations, stabilizing concentrations means that the flow is net zero, otherwise the stock would move. So stabilize temperature, stabilize concentrations, that means net zero. Roughly speaking, the earlier you go to net zero, the lower the temperature at which you stabilize. Even if, God forbid, we stabilized at four degrees centigrade, it would still have to be net zero, otherwise it wouldn't be stable. So that's the basic physics and uh, you can fiddle about with it and make it more complicated but uh, the guts of it is in what uh, I just said and the uh, that's so we have to cut our global emissions by roughly half or a bit under a half this decade and that shows just how urgent the action is uh, in order to hold to 1.5 and uh, we have to go to net zero by mid-century of CO2 uh, for 1.5. The graph here is CO2e. You should always check whether we're talking about CO2e or CO2, sometimes one, sometimes the other, depending on the context and depending on the data available. But roughly speaking, CO, CO2e is CO2 equivalent, including the effect of the other greenhouse uh, gases. So um, we have to go to net zero um, by mid-century in CO2 in order to uh, stabilize at 1.5 and only we've only got another decade or so if we can stabilize at uh, two this is what's been happening so we are not turning down yes some signs of stabilization but uh, we are not turning down yet note the remarkable first decade first decade of this century when chinese emissions shot up 
as a result of very rapid growth, which was coal fired. Coal is more or less stabilized in China. It's been on a plateau for a few years, but it has ticks up and it ticks down. It's ticking up slightly uh, uh, just now. But uh, 11 of the uh, 31 um, provinces of China, most of the East Coast provinces, have already uh, stabilized and are starting to go down. Uh, but how fast China goes down, of course, is the number one story. There are about 30% of the emissions. And the EU is well placed to be a real collaborator with China. And that's a very big responsibility for the EU and China, of course. The, um, so um, I've already started talking about what people are doing. I won't go through this in, uh, in any uh, detail, but you know that many countries now have set the net zero goal, Austria by 20. 40 the private sector is getting more and more committed the concept of net zero has been very helpful there because if they're not the net zero for the total means that you have to have net zero for almost everybody because they're not going to be so many uh, net negatives so the concept of net zero which is basic to the whole stabilization story has actually come to the fore in the last two or three years, or three or four years, and it's been very helpful because that's something that everybody can adopt. When we were talking about cutting emissions by um, 80% from 1990 to 2050, which we might have been talking about 10 years or so ago, it's remarkable how many people thought they were in the 20% that didn't have to do anything. But with net zero, it's net zero. And that's something that applies to everybody. And I think it has actually changed the debate in an important way, particularly actually for the private sector. This is why 1.5 and 2 really matters. I haven't got time to go into the detail, but we used to think below 2 degrees was a sort of borderline for dangerous. And then we had the IPCC report of 2018 comparing 1.5 and 2, and there's a very big difference. Just look at the first... Uh, line in this, the proportion of the global population exposed to severe heat at least once every five years uh, goes up from 14% to 37%. And in some cases, that exposure to extreme heat is uh, fatal. You know? So once is enough to, uh, to take you out. And uh, that's 1.5 to 2. And of course, if it's much higher than that, those things go up very quickly. I haven't got time to go into any detail, but that's one thing we've understood much better since the Paris Agreement of 2015, is why it matters to distinguish between 1.5 and uh, 2. These are the kinds... Now, I have a very quick word on economic modelling, but some of the economic modelling, particularly around the uh, integrated assessment models, which my friend Bill Nordhaus pioneered and pioneered very interestingly, I think what we've now seen is that they have outlived their usefulness. The, um, essentially, the kind of risks we're talking about are way beyond the losses uh, down the track of 5 or 10% of GDP. I mean, if you only lost 5 or 10% of GDP 100 years from now and the economy had grown 1% a year for 100 years, you wouldn't worry very much. I mean, we're talking about much deeper catastrophic risks than are contained in these models. And uh, also the models we've been building as, as economists, because we like to be able to solve that for equilibria, we build in diminishing returns to scale, because without diminishing returns to scale, you don't get a competitive equilibrium. And uh, uh, we uh, build in quite modest technical progress. But actually that does not describe the way in which technology has changed. Increasing returns to scale are enormously important in discovery and in uh, production, as we've found out very clearly over the last uh, five or uh, ten years. So both on the risk side and on the technology side, the dominant economic model, in my view, has been deeply inadequate, and Joe Stiglitz and I and others have been writing about uh, how we approach this in a different way. But having concentrated on the damages and how difficult all this uh, would be, um, let me point out, and Robert referred to this, in my view, this is the growth story of the 21st century. And for very good Schumpeterian reasons, we're in the right city to discuss uh, Schumpeter. Uh, 
And this is a story of quite extraordinarily rapid discovery and change. And uh, that is a growth story in terms of the investments we have to make. I differ from my friend Jean Pisani Ferry in, in thinking um, that our investment requirements is the right language rather than our investment costs. Because those are investments with very powerful returns over and above the fundamental one of reducing climate risk. Like, for example, they produce electricity cheaper. I mean, they produce it without polluting the atmosphere now in our cities, similarly for transport and so on. So many investments in natural capital have all kinds of returns um, beyond simply being uh, net negative. These are very powerfully important investments. And uh, it's, yes, it's true we have to invest two or three percentage points of GDP extra, not in China. China is a question of shifting the balance, but uh, elsewhere. But those are investments with very powerful returns uh, on the whole. So I like to think of them as investment requirements, investment opportunities, rather than investment costs. But they're investments that absolutely have to be made. And they're powerful increases in output, both in the demand side and sharpening supply in the short to medium term. A real Schumpeterian story of discovery and growth in the medium term. And there is no long run high carbon growth story. It doesn't exist because it destroys the environment that we all need to live in. So this is the growth story of the 21st century. It's the technologies of this century, not the last century, that's going to drive employment growth and rising living standards and better health and uh, welfare. But don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean it's all win, win, win. You have to invest to get there. You have to change the structure to get there, and that is of uh, vital importance. Um, and managing dislocation, managing change on this scale, is now the economic issue. How do we get that investment done? How do we get the innovation? How do we manage change? That's not really in the kind of economic models that people use to discuss climate change. So we should be discussing extreme risk, and particularly we should be discussing the economics of very rapid systematic, systemic fundamental structural change. That's the economic problem. There's nothing more fascinating, and it's hard, but it is absolutely essential that we as economists take the lead. And the best collection of research economists in most countries is actually in the central bank. I'm deeply attached to the Treasury in the UK. I worked there very cheerfully for a number of years. But the economists at, at the Bank of England are more numerous and better qualified than the economists at the Treasury. That's absolutely objective reality. It's, it's not opinion. Just look. So I've already emphasised the importance of investment, and we're going to look in some detail, uh, but fast, at uh, what policies we need to draw through the right kind, the right kind of uh, investment. And remember, we live in a world where planned, and just to go back, you know, we have the great economist Schumpeter that we've referred to. Let's also refer to Keynes, and. Uh, we have a world where planned investment is insufficient relative to planned saving. And um, what's the answer? Well, surely not to cut planned saving, it's to increase planned investment. And that's our uh, challenge. And of course, um, I'll also refer to the great Hayek, what matters for investment is expectations. So our policies have to hit the right things in terms of market failures, and I'll go through a few of them in just a moment but they have to be policies that are credible over the medium term if they are to support investment. You know all about predictable flexibility um, in central banks. That's what you do, at least that's what I hope you do. Yeah. Uh, you have to be flexible because the world changes, but you have to be predictable so people understand what you're doing. That's even more important in investment and microeconomics than it is in macroeconomics, and it's very important in macroeconomics. So uh, that is a key principle, not only to hit the market failures and the market absences, but to be predictably flexible. So let's look at what we have to do, the second part, and I'll have to accelerate a little bit. I've already emphasized very strongly expectations. And all too often, I mean, the, the case of solar in Europe is a, is a clear example. It was very successful, the incentives to, uh, to, to do solar, and, my, and suddenly our Finance Ministry said, my goodness, this has been so successful, it's costing us a lot of money. And whack, they turned it off. 
what should have happened is to say the purpose of these uh, supports for solar are to drive down costs and increase adoption. As the costs go down and as the adoption goes up, then we will reduce these subsidies. That's what predictable flexibility means. And we have to get much better at that. So it's not simply hitting the market failures. And I'll turn to that in just a moment. It's being predictably flexible. There's nobody better than central banks to explain the importance of predictable flexibility because that's what they live by. Just to emphasize that this is in large measure private sector investment. Um, this is just a simple sketch, but you, you know it, that um, government investment as a fraction of investment, of course it varies across countries, but it's typically between 12 or 13 percent and 17 or 18 percent of investment. Now that can be a very important part of investment in driving private sector investment. You know, a lot of the infrastructure for electric vehicles will at least have to be facilitated by the public sector. A lot of the investment a lot of that investment can be private sector too, but it has to be facilitated in some part. Complementary investment uh, would be necessary. For example, in the way in which our cities work, the way in which our roads work, you know, we're going to have, in the UK, we're going to have to adapt our lampposts to become helpful for uh, you know, charging electric vehicles and so on. This is the kind of area where you're going to have to have cooperation in design and cooperation in investment. But nevertheless, the bulk of the investment will be in the private sector. So the biggest part of the question of how do we get the investment is what policies do we bring to pull forward that investment of the right kind and the innovation? And um, how do we finance those investments? This is for the, uh, how many people here are economists? Oh yeah, that's a much higher proportion than normal, but way, way off way off 100%. This is for the uh, economists. There's a lot of economics underlying each row of this, but let me go through it very fast. First, foremost, up at the top is the greenhouse gas externality. That's number one. What do we do? Well, carbon tax is the first shot. But remember, the economics does not say that carbon pricing is unambiguously the most efficient, even if, even if that was the only one because we live in a world with deep uncertainty and increasing returns to scale. And in such a world, clear standards and regulation can give the kind of confidence to investors that they need to invest on scale and drive down the costs. But don't get me wrong, carbon tax should be at central center thing. But if any economist tells you, economic shirt tells us unambiguously, carbon pricing is always the most efficient way of doing it, wrong. That requires a world without uncertainty and a world uh, without increasing returns to scale. Both qualifications of great importance. But nevertheless, that's the top one and carbon pricing is the top mechanism. But we've got to get our economics right. We mustn't say things are unambiguously true when they're not unambiguously true. But there are, of course, many more. There's R&D, which is key importance in this area. We all know that ideas are public goods. We all know, particularly in central banks, the deficiencies of capital markets uh, in handling risk. We do much better with capital markets than without capital markets, but still, we can't claim that, that they are anywhere near perfect in handling risk. Lots to do there. That's why, for example, we have development banks and why we, we very recently persuaded the Chancellor of the, the Exchequer in the UK to establish a development bank why we have international development banks as well. A lot of this is networks, electricity grids, public uh, transport, re, uh, recycling, um, broadband. So, so much of this is network. And we know that networks need strong government policies to function well because my presence and activities in the network affects your you are another part of the network, affects what you can do. And those are areas where you don't necessarily need government ownership, but you certainly need government policy, otherwise they won't work. Uh, Robert quite rightly referred to asymmetries of information. We need to know what's in what we're buying. Um, uh, producers need to know what's available. In a world of rapid change, that's really important. The last one is hugely important. We use the very flat term of co-benefits. Uh, think of air pollution. Air pollution kills depending on how you do the numbers, seven, eight, nine, ten million people a year, 
in a world, or is associated with those deaths, it may not be the only cause, but strongly associated, in a world where we probably have a little over 50 million deaths a year. This is a huge, and not all of it, of course, is burning fossil fuels, but a lot of it is burning fossil fuels. That's a very powerful benefit now. You don't have to wait 20 or 30 years for that one to come through. It's immense. Each one of these market failures is not some sort of afterthought or footnote. Each one of these is crucial to defining policy. So we have to think of policy as a package which tackles these market failures. Now, there are also market absences, and uh, there we turn to Hayek. Market absences means expectations are enormously important, and I've already emphasized that. You can't transact in the technologies we're going to use uh, 20 or 30 years from now. We know we're going to need some, uh, but we, we don't know what they are. So you can't transact. You really can't track tax transact credibly for a carbon price 20, 25 years down the track. Market absences are a crucial part of this as well as market failures. And again, central banks are good at expectations. They do, that's what they do all day, manage expectations. Um, I know they do other things as well, but that is a, a critical part of the whole story. All, now, the key responsibilities here lie not with central banks, they lie with finance ministries and public policy. So when people ask me the question about what is it that, uh, is this the responsibility of central banks, I try to say it's also the responsibility of central banks, but the primary story lies with finance ministries and with prime ministers and presidents. But we know that, uh, and I hope we can deal a, a bit more with this in the, in the discussion which will follow, we know that on the whole, when we designed as a world, sensibly, the independent central bank of the sort of 1990s, we had in mind a world where we thought prices were quite good reflectors of scarcity. And uh, often they are, but not always, and less so when we think about climate change. That was number one. Number two, we thought that the models of our economies were models of a structure that was moderately stable. That was the second part of our story. And the third part of our story was that we had some understanding of shocks, the kinds of shocks that could come along. I would suggest that each one of those three is less secure now than it might have been in the 1990s. So we have to reappraise those, that story, not of the independence of the central bank, I hope that's sacrosanct, but of what the central bank has to take into account. We know, and there's some good work which I'll quote, discuss a little more tomorrow, that says very clearly that climate is not in the market. It's not in the prices to anything near the extent that it should be. Should be in relation to the targets we ourselves have uh, set. Uh, we know that's the first point. Do prices reflect scarcity as well? The second point, are our structures stable? Actually, we want to make them very different. It's not that it's annoying that they might change. We actually want to change them, to change our uh, economies. And we see that different kinds of shocks come along. So we have to reassess. And uh, the idea of market neutrality as being blind acceptance of market prices as indication of scarcity. It's just wrong. Sometimes we say, look, prices are very good. I mean, if you, if you live in a Chicago world, prices are perfect. Um, but even if they're not, we don't quite know which way they're not perfect. So let's not be presumptuous. Actually, we know in which direction the markets are going wrong. They are underpricing the risk and the damage of uh, climate change. So market neutrality needs another look. Uh, and it's not that we're picking winners if we think about what we buy when we do quantitative easing. It's not that we're picking winners. We are avoiding amplification of risk in the future. And too often people say, ah, you're picking winners, you know what's right. This is the usual arrogance of people who don't understand markets. Well, that's dead wrong because we can see which way they're going wrong. We're not picking the winners. We are asking where is the big risk and should we be amplifying big risk? And I think that's a very important uh, argument we have to uh, stress.
Um, the, uh, all aspects of public finance important, you know, domestic resource mobilization, international you know, private flows, voluntary carbon markets. Let's talk about that a little later when we have our uh, discussion. Robert already argued very persuasively that this is uh, macro critical and I've tried to, I fully agree and that uh, it's very important that we recognize that the primary, the primary responsibility for making policy here is with the uh, ministries of finance. And I've described you know, th through R&D, carbon pricing, regulation, all the things that they can and, uh, and they uh, should do. Um, we've already talked a lot about, uh, at least I've raised the issue of uh, market neutrality and what it means. Um, but there's also a great deal of work that's going on and you're very familiar with, and it's, a, it's tremendous work really, associated with the network on greening the financial system, looking um, in some detail at stress tests and sources of, uh, of instability, asking how you insist on the revelation of the right kind of information so that people can judge those risks. Actually, there's a tremendous amount, you know that even better than I do, tremendous amount of very valuable and important work going on, showing very clearly not only why central banks have to do this, but how to do it and sharing ideas on how that uh, happens. Now, so we've talked about the policies to draw through the investments. We've talked about uh, the role of central banks. Let me, before I close, say something very quickly about collaboration, because this is par excellence a story of international action. The, when you're looking at the concentration of greenhouse gases as the driver of uh, warming, uh, the atmosphere doesn't care whether the KG came from, uh, you know, uh, Johannesburg or Vienna or London or Delhi or, or wherever. It's really very powerfully a global public bad. And collaboration here is enormously important. Now, we teach our students about the importance of open markets and the gains from trade, and we're right, because that is important. But the gains from collaboration, I think, at the moment, are unique in economic history. There's the Keynesian recovery. I know we've got all kinds of difficult things on the supply side and on the demand side, but we live in a world which for some time now has had planned uh, investment too small in relation to planned saving. Of course, much better if we move together, otherwise the increase in demand leaks out into another country and is less powerful. Expectations. If all countries are moving strongly in a good direction, it means investors can see that if they invest in making a really good electric car, the market out there in the world is going to grow. So expectations of joint action are very important for the investment process. Economies of scale are incredibly important. We have benefited from having India expand very quickly LEDs. India drove down the cost of LEDs. China drove down the cost of solar. And the more we get that global economies of scale, the faster our costs will uh, come down. And of course, we're dealing with the global public good of pollution, climate, biodiversity. Four big reasons, particularly powerful now, why we must collaborate uh, internationally. There is why I think, you know, Robert and I have spent our lives, big parts of our lives in international institutions. They've never been more important than uh, now. Also, the G7, G20 processes. We finally have, you know, we have UK, uh, Italy in G7, G20, next year Germany, Indonesia, the year after Japan, India. The, you remember last year what it was? Well, it, it, it was Trump's United States and Saudi. We have a chance over these next three years of really moving strongly together. And I think the EU, and of course Austria within the EU, Germany in the G7 will be a very powerful part of this story of not simply moving from a G7 to a G20 to a G7 to a G20, where in each one you have the particular enthusiasm of that particular prime minister or president. We hope we'll be telling a story of recovery and growth, which is sustained across, uh, uh, across these three years. Then we can start to get the momentum that we uh, need. I'm 
running out of time. I've probably already run out of time. So I hope that uh, I can just quickly run through these in just a, a minute or two. It's a, a critical decade. I've already said that uh, infrastructure doubles in the next 15 or 20... Infrastructure doubles in the next 15 or 20 years. If that looks anything like the infrastructure we have already, say goodbye to three degrees. We decide on that infrastructure in the next five or 10 years, if it's going to be built in the next 15 or 20 years. We're in a big, a really big uh, hurry. Um, the government policies, I hope I've run through. Uh, let me emphasize that a lot of this is about systemic change. Uh, you don't redesign a city with a carbon price. A carbon price would support the design the city. But there's so much we have to do around our systems. We, perhaps we can discuss agriculture in, uh, during the discussion period. But we spend seven, $800 billion a year on agricultural subsidies. What do we get? Degraded land, poisoned rivers, and destroyed forests. Now, maybe that number's about right. I don't know. Let's suppose it is. But we could certainly spend it much better than we do now. But that's about redesigning our system or systems of agriculture and support for agriculture, including the common agricultural policy. So there is a whole range of things that we have to uh, look at, and we have to manage a just, a just transition. At the pace and scale that we're moving, there's going to be dislocation. And we have to try to give everybody a chance to participate in these new jobs that will come through, but where that's not possible, to protect them by investing in people and uh, places. This is a very big uh, uh, story of uh, management of change. The uh, financial institutions, I, I, let's discuss the, the, the multilateral development banks during the, the story that's coming, but they have an in, in, enormously important role to play, particularly in emerging markets and uh, poorer countries. The use of the SDRs, I hope that part of that <clears throat> will be to create a, uh, a um, resilience and sustainability um, trust alongside the, uh, the uh, Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. There's lots more that our institutions can do. We have to share a vision across the G7 and G20. Let me advertise the paper that we prepared for the G7, <coughs> which they very kindly welcomed in the, in the communique, but it's to try to sort of set out what the world and the G7, G20 should be trying to do together. And the last slide, having displayed anxiety for much of the talk, the last slide is a bit of hope. Uh, what, is, what is out there that uh, helps us along? Well, low interest rates, uh, because of this story of planned uh, investment being too small in relation to planned saving, quite remarkable technical change. Uh, international agreements now to underpin the story. Not perfect, but we have them since Paris. And finally, for someone who works at a university, the young people have been absolutely tremendous on this. I grew up in the 60s where we fought the uh, Vietnam War and apartheid and civil rights, and we were intensely political. And I think, looking back, we were on the right side of history. There was quite a long period where they seemed to have gone to sleep. But now, these last five years or so, our young people, our students, are back on the right side of history and the pressure that they bring, and not simply shouting at us to do something. Now, my students at the LSE, I'm sure your students here in, in Vienna, they understand what to do, and they're researching what to do, and they're pushing us to do it. And so they're very well informed, very thoughtful activists. They're not just uh, shouters. And that uh, gives me uh, at least some hope. So I'm very optimistic about what we can do, but I really, really worry about what we will do. I'm sorry I went on a bit long. I'm sorry. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you much, Nick. I think uh, it was a very engaged and fascinating overview which you gave her. And I'm sure we could spend not the rest of the event discussing your thesis. We have for a few others who also would like to take the floor. But I think we should take a few questions. Uh, and looking into the hall who wants to start. Uh, before somebody wants to break the ice, I would like to ask a question. If I listen to your story, I think it came along saying uh, climate change is the growth story. There's no alternative. The second part, are, 
sounds a little big like Maggie Thatcher, but now in the other direction, but I fully, I think one can buy into that. Now with regard to that, when I mentioned this, or yesterday we had her through the governing council, electronically and physically, a meeting with the international investors. And again here, what you also mentioned came up to say, uh, well, uh, we have a real chance of investment because uh, there's a lot of uh, potential there, which is unearthed. And the question was then, why didn't it happen? And uh, uh, we had also Mr. Hildebrand there who followed it uh, from the other side. And the question was, why, why is it that we have a lot of resources, you mentioned it, we have a lot of possibilities. Why is it that the investors don't uh, take this opportunity? One intervention by a governance colleague said, well, the problem is that uh, uh, currently in most of Europe, uh, the, uh, the carbon price is at something like 20 or 30, or so it's best. Uh, in order to make this investment uh, uh, a really uh, useful from a financial point of view, the price needs to be at 100. Now the question is, uh, we all think the price will be at 100 or higher, but apparently the investors don't believe it. So the question it was, what does it bring, who will, what bring, will bring the price up? Will it be a commitment with a fixed price pushed forward, supported by taxes, supported by commitment about uh, cap and trade, what is it? Because if the story as we heard is yesterday true, then we have a problem of credibility of politics. So who is able to uh, create now this, this breakthrough? Um, you, you know that's a hard question, Robert. Um, one part of the story is, is to be ambitious and strong about carbon prices. Um, Joe Stiglitz and I and others have suggested $100 a tonne by 2030. The IMF have suggested 75 for the richer countries, 50 for the middle countries, 25 for the poorer countries as floors, as carbon price floors. I think that's quite an interesting idea. And actually for the same reason as you have a difference between purchasing power parity and market prices in most valuations, you know, there is a reason actually to have the carbon price a bit lower in poorer countries because that's relative to, you know, factor prices and so on in those countries. So um, the more we press as to what we need, I think the more we push that discussion along. There never will be certainty that that's not the, wor the world we could ever live in, but we're trying to reduce the uncertainty associated. But also, um, I do think that this is a reason which I emphasized in what I said, and good reason in, in economic theory, where you have credibility problems, where you have risk, and where you have increasing returns to scale. There is an, exa there is a, a, an argument for standards. I actually prefer standards rather than regulation. Everybody wants good standards. I mean, who wants bad standards? That's terrible. But you know, people bristle against regulation. So let, let's talk about standards and regulation in that order. But we regulated out the incandescent light bulb. We had to be reasonably positive that other things could come. But we didn't pick the winner. We described what was very bad, but we didn't pick the winner. And before long, it turned out to be LED light bulbs. But the clarity that said, after this date, you cannot sell the incandescent light bulb was a very important part of credibility. I think the car makers of the world have understood, not particularly through the carbon price, but through the broad objectives, the broad planning, the regulation in UK, you'll not be able to sell an internal combustion engine vehicle after 2030. I think those... <coughs> You don't have to worry, I've been jabbed three times and I've got proof from yesterday lunchtime, uh, PCR. It's the change of season. Um, sometimes standards are seen, perhaps often, standards are seen as more credible than prices alone. But please don't get me wrong, 
it's really important that we have the strong prices. What I'm saying is, and the standards and regulation, and the city design, and the support for R&D, and the uh, strong treatment of air pollution. The six market failures that I described in the, uh, in, in the talk, we've got to act on all of them. And they're different problems of credibility in different places. Uh, sometimes the courts are helpful. Uh, the Supreme Court in the UK ruled that the British government had failed to meet the standards that were required on air pollution. And it has, it has an effect. You know, in Germany, the, the highest court has said that the government's not doing enough. In, in, uh, in the Netherlands, they ruled that uh, Shell was not doing enough. So there are various routes into the credibility issue. But don't get me wrong, clear as possible, strong carbon prices, top of my list. But it absolutely cannot be the end of the list. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the hand up uh, by Professor Schneider. One, two, three, and then we have to close. Yes, please. Frederick hmm. Schneider, University of Linz. I thank you very much for your excellent talk and the list what we should do. Uh, coming from the public choice tradition, I miss one very important aspect. How will you get majorities and how will you bring government act in this way, as you said? That's very nice, very logic. And, and if all would do it, we would be live in a first best world. But unfortunately, except China, who can use like a dictatorship doing it also quickly if they want, take India, take other huge democracies like Brazil. Um, I think we, we have to do much more research and much more brilliant ideas as with the technical progress that we will get majorities to pass these laws to get on such a, uh, on such a pass. Yeah? Elsewhere we will fail because look only at this winter, my last remark. The heat prices are climbing up a bit. Yeah? And all of a sudden, all of us, all the uh, European Union, a huge cry now, we have to stop now all uh, European market common policy against uh, for climate change, etc. Yeah? And if the prices will go up uh, somewhat, yeah, we will experience this, this winter that we will make a lot of exceptions. No, not this winter, maybe next, maybe etc. Et so I really think, uh, do you have an idea? That will be my concrete question what you could do on this side, because in most countries we have democracies and we have to find majorities to get such a long-term pass and to avoid uh, always the silly question, why we and not the others? Thank you. Thank you. Quick. Yeah, it's a very important uh, question. Remember my last sentence is that I'm very optimistic about what we can do, but I worry deeply about what we will do in large measure for these reasons. Let, let me run to things very quickly because we're, 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 we're short of time. Ma a just transition and managing dislocation is a very explicit central part of this story will be uh, very important. The private sector arguing to government that actually there's a tremendous amount of investment uh, possibility out there. If you get the right policies and we organize the right finance, this will be the driver of growth. My experience is that treasuries take private investors more seriously than professors of economics at the London School of Economics. The private sector can do a great deal. The young people, I think, are a very powerful part of this story. And they're voting with their feet and they're voting with their uh, pensions. Unilever get two million job applications a year because Paul Pullman transformed that company over a 10 year period. They're getting the very best people to come and work and the private sector realize those possibilities. So the politics and the pressure of all this are very important. And some part of it are things that governments can do and other parts of it are things which different parts of the body politic can put pressure on government. But managing dislocation will be a very important part of what government can do to handle uh, this story. And I just qualify, China, politics, I've been working in China for more than 30 years. Politics in China is a deep, complicated thing. To uh, describe China as a monolithic dictatorship is a bit simple. A lot of
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nick. Um, you mentioned a lot of uh, things, and I could ask you so many things, but I know that uh, time is limited. So let me focus on, on one question, and, and I hope that Philip doesn't want to ask the same uh, question. It's about, you know, that climate change or combating climate change is a global task. And we all know that uh, we have a certain response or great responsibility in the developed world. But we also have, you know, to be integrative and to take care of developing uh, countries. So, uh, at the same time, I observe that public spending towards um, developing countries does not really significantly increase. So, what would, from your perspective, be the best approach um, to, you know, get a solution also for developing countries to involve them in the whole process, um, realizing that they are at a different stage. They are, you know, the demand on extra energy or access to energy is significantly high, right? Um, at the same time, they will suffer the most from climate change. Um, so, the question I do have, of course, we need more public spending. That's already, uh, you know, something which is uh, extremely difficult because the n national budgets are always focusing on their own spending in order to manage the transition. So, th this is one uh, threat. Second thing is, you know, as you said, it's always a collaboration between the public and the private sector. So, isn't there way that we can spend public money in order to trigger private to trigger private money like public uh, public private partnerships or whatsoever so that would be very interesting and helpful uh, to hear your view on that yeah, two very big questions uh, I, I wouldn't use the language take care of you know, the, the countries of the developing world are countries that are taking care of themselves and they recognize they live in a complex, difficult world where climate change is important. So it's support that matters, uh, collaboration. And there, the most important thing by far is low cost finance on scale, precisely because, as I emphasize, this is an investment story. More and more, the countries of the developing world and the countries of the rich world are adopting seeing the argument that this is the growth story it's new kind of investment it's more investment and it's going to drive a different growth story than we've seen in the past more and more that argument is winning it's not one but it's uh, winning so helping show that through demonstrating the right kind of investment is very important in our own countries and low-cost finance the story used to be and i've been working in india for more than 50 years is that uh, we need low-cost finance and we need technology. That second argument is dropping away because technology is more and more available everywhere and actually being developed in China and India and so on. It's the low-cost finance. At the beginning of Paris, I was working very closely with Al Gore, Prime Minister Modi's telephone call to Barack Obama is, if I have to pay eight, nine percent real for my infrastructure projects, how can I make these? investment. Modi was right then and he's uh, right now. And there's so much we can do to bring down the cost of finance in large measure. Again, this is what central banks understand very well. It's about reducing, managing, allocating risk, partly through the public policies. And we, we talked about predictable uh, flexibility, but also by organizing capital markets in a way in ways that take early stage risk in different ways. And here, development banks are enormously important, both domestic development banks and international development banks. For $40 billion one-off paid in capital, we could double the lending capability of the uh, international system. The brilliance of Keynes with paid in capital and callable capital. So first and foremost, bringing down the cost of capital. And second, almost as important, demonstrating in our own ways uh, that we are doing it and uh, finding new ways. Thank you very much. I think we have one last question up there. Professor Felbermeyer, uh, not in Kiel anymore, where you were, you were recently. Uh, he's now in Vienna. Okay, yes. Mr. Felbermeyer. Hi, Nick. Nice to meet you again. So I, was, I was wondering about the debates that we are just now having in Germany about the debt break, uh, or in Europe about uh, 
what we do with the Stability and Growth Pact. And then we know we need uh, public investment. You're, you're right, private investment will have, you know, will have to be very important and will, be, will take the lion's share, but we will need much more public investment. So what do we do with uh, these break mechanisms that we have uh, established uh, in Europe everywhere? What's your recommendation? Uh, that's the, I know it's a very critical question. In Germany, the coalition partners uh, will we'll see what's, what's coming out of it, but also in the Eurozone. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, the one sentence answer is don't confuse uh, fiscal responsibility with premature austerity. But of course, to develop that uh, sentence, we have to grow out of our COVID crisis. We have to invest in order to tackle the climate crisis and we should put those two things together and we should think through fiscal responsibility over say a 10-year period and ask how do we generate investment and growth over a 10-year period so we tackle the debt G to GDP ratio through the uh, numerator and the denominator. That's not going to be easy but if we're clear that that's what we're going to do no premature austerity this is a growth story we're planning for our fiscal responsibility this is what we have in mind if we grow to our tax program over the years and set it out over that time period so that there's confidence for the uh, investment uh, process 100 years ago we made the mistake of coming out of the spanish flu in the first world war with great big consumption booms and that uh, didn't end happily. And uh, a dozen years ago, we acted well in 2009, but we jumped straight into premature austerity and we choked off investment and growth. So at least they're lessons of history. There are two mistakes we shouldn't make, but I think we cannot make them by setting out a 10-year program for growth and for fiscal responsibility. The fiscal responsibility is up front but it's not misinterpreted as premature austerity. Uh, the absolutely last <laughs> question I have for... Uh, could we do the following two short questions, and uh, you and then Barbara, and then how to say you answer both together? Okay. Uh, yeah, but nobody a short and perhaps uh, simple uh, central bank-oriented uh, question. Uh, to repair for these... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, market failures means that prices have to increase, uh, especially also energy prices. So in some way, what we, it uh, turns out, this may be seen as something like an oil shock in slow motion. Now, for central banks, if they have uh, a price stability orientation, this means that uh, there is a very high chance that inflation rates will be higher than what they aim to, uh, to achieve. There, then there will be the, the question whether to answer a cost push inflation via demand side measures. If central bank do this, for instance, via increasing interest rates, we would get into the strong uh, danger of having a kind of a a stagflation scenario or central banks will have to accept somewhat not dramatically but somewhat higher uh, inflation rates for a, a long period of time what would be your answer for that I, I think i tried to give a quantitative answer that avoided exaggeration um energy in terms of gdp maybe what three four five percent uh, if that went up by 30 percent yeah then that would be a one-off one or two percent increase in prices one-off so i don't think we should exaggerate this uh, this problem and secondly the more successful they are the more irrelevant carbon prices become uh, because over time we don't have any more fossil fuels so the tax on fossil fuels doesn't matter now that's success 2025 30 years 
down uh, the line. So I think the more important one is not actually the central bankers. I love them all and they're terribly important. But the most important one is the politics of uh, people on low incomes who may be hit particularly hard, who have a bigger share of their income in uh, energy related uh, expenditures. So I would see it as actually a micro social issue, a very important one of getting through that protection as part of a just transition. Thank you. And uh, finally, by my colleague. Uh, thank you. Quick question. As a true Austrian and Hayekian, I believe in the division of labor that you mentioned so often, and, but also in collaboration. And you mentioned you prefer standards to regulation. And if we look right at the technical part, uh, the US is believing in, in technology-driven smart cars, whereas China, for example, is looking at infrastructure-driven smart streets. Uh, how do you see the point of competition there, and where do we get this into, where, where do we price this in? I, I think it's obvious you need both. You know, you need smart cars on smart streets. And uh, I actually, I, it may be that Europe's the first there. You know, European cities are much nicer places than US uh, cities. We're, we're sitting in one. And the way in which we put those together is absolutely crucial. And there's lots to talk about. I hope this is one where Europe can lead the way. The Chinese are thinking very seriously about both the smart cars and the smart cities. And let's learn from them, but let's give examples where maybe they can learn from the EU. Unfortunately, this ends our Q&A. We have to stop here. Let's give her again a hand uh, to Lord Stern. <laughs> and with this, I hand over to Madame Macrosen in order to invite the panel to the floor here. Thank you.